thanks for clicking in. We upload videos every week, so be sure to subscribe so that you can receive your encouragement. And as you are listening in, you may feel led to connect with the ministry. So you can check out our description for different ways on how to do so. And you may also sow into our ministry using the various ways that we have to give. Your giving goes to all of the outreaches that we conduct all throughout the month, every month. Now, let's listen in. Sometimes late at night, I get in trouble. I start before I go to bed. It's a bad habit. I I try to be spiritual and pray and read a book before I go to bed, a chapter of a book. But every now and then when I can't sleep and I get restless, I go on Instagram and I just start scrolling. You know, uh, you know, it can get me in trouble sometimes. I'm not a hater or nothing. I just, you know, there's stuff I probably just shouldn't see before I go to sleep. I've had moments where I start dreaming about it. So I know that's not healthy. So I'm trying to, to get away from it. But every now and then, it's not every night. And a couple weeks ago, I was scrolling and I saw somebody I knew and they, they posted a picture of a, a new car they got. And I said, okay, that's nice. But what caught my attention was the hashtags they used. And the hashtag they used underneath of the picture of their new car was hashtag success, <laughs> hashtag winning. And I didn't judge them at all. But I sat back and I said, it's interesting because everybody's gauge of what winning and what success looks like is completely different. And I, I'm not saying that that is wrong. If that's his gauge, that's, that's his gauge. He's not hustling. He's not slinging drugs or rock. He, he actually earned that car. So if, if his good job allowed him to get that car and he says that's when I'm, I'm okay with that. It's just not what I would post. And I started thinking, what would I post if I was to have to capture a picture and hashtag it success or hashtag it winning, what's the picture I would post? Think about that. If you had to post a picture and use just those two hashtags, success and winning, what picture would you post? Would it be walking across the stage and getting your degree? Would it be a picture with your family? Would it be you sitting at the desk of your new job? What would your picture be? I started asking myself this question, and and I learned this in life, that people gauge success by what was modeled as success to them as children. This is why when we go into the housing community sometimes and a nice car rides by, all the young boys on the corner are like, oh, man. It's because having a nice car was seen as success to them when they were younger. And so whatever was modeled to you as success when you were younger, that's what you see as arriving as an adult. Now, the tragedy of my life is I grew up poor. So success modeled to me did not involve stuff. It was not my my foundation. To this day, everything I buy, I can justify it by either a door that God has opened up for me or rooms that I'm stepping into. That's how I justify everything I buy in my life. It's because of opportunities that God has given me and and I, I wrestle with myself. Even if I spend a dollar, I'm battling back and forth because if it does not tie to my purpose, it should be in my savings. So, so what was modeled to me as success growing up was, was not materialism. I came from a broken family, so my selfie wouldn't be family, you know, though family's great and family's important. Uh, my family, my parents didn't have six figure jobs, so a great career is not success to me. What is success to me? It's not cars. It's not clothing. The thing my family honored or practice towards me, that is, was honor. 
Honor is what catches me. Honor is actually what has opened so many doors in my life. Is is I've just honored. I wasn't the best electrician when I was an electrician, but I honored my bosses so well, they kept promoting me. To this day, half the stuff that is required of an electrician, I didn't even know how to do. But I was just so good at honoring that sometimes they would give me a lesser task because they liked me. True story. Now I knew stuff, but I didn't always know how to do it. But honor has taken me a long way in life. And I watched my mom as a child honor my father. She honored him. I mean, he would work construction eight, ten hours a day. And my dad was not the best man. He was an alcoholic. He was a drug addict. He would stay out three nights a week and then come home. And we didn't know where he was, but no questions were asked. He would miss Christmases or Christmases come in as we're opening gifts, stumbling through the doors. He, he was not the best man, but she honored him. I, I remember once a week it was a treat my mom would fry ham on the oven. And my dad always got the piece with the bone in it. I don't even know what was so special. Maybe it had more flavor. So that maybe that's one of the things that's success. Whenever I go out, I like to have the T-bone steak with the bone. So, so maybe, 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 maybe I would post a picture of a steak. But, but she would always give him the ham with the bone in it. Because I think it had more flavor and that's what he liked. Whenever he was on his way home, he had his little spot on the couch. And she would make everybody get off of his spot. She'd have the remote ready for him. And he'd come in. And I just watched her honor him. And, and my father, though he had his flaws, he always pushed me towards honor. Hold the door open for that lady. If he saw somebody, a, a woman in particular, who couldn't, you know, had a flat tire on the side of the road, my dad would always pull over. And change the tire. We could be heading to church. And he, he would get down on his back and get on his knees and, and change somebody's tire. I do the same. I just have triple A. So I'll pull over. I'll get you going. You know, and I, they'll come and I'll confirm it. And then I leave. You know, I'm a little bougier than that. Just saying. <laughs> Thank God for resources. But... I learned these things and, and my dad, though he didn't always go to church with us, he was a city kid and he went to a church that sent buses into the city and that became my mother's church home as I got older and our family church home. And the pastor there, his name was Pastor Earl Johnson. He was the pastor of Grace Bible Baptist on Rolling Road. My mom went there for years, years. She didn't leave there till I started my church. And now she's serving in the nursery with the babies. But, but Pastor Johnson was like up here in our home. Even when my family didn't go to church for maybe a year at a time, Pastor Johnson was up here. They never talked bad about Pastor Johnson. They always honored Pastor Johnson. It was Pastor Johnson, Pastor Johnson, Pastor Johnson. And because they honored him so well, when, when I would hit pits in my life, I knew where to go. And ultimately, though I never went to his church, I wasn't like Baptist, you know. I had more of a like Pentecostal spirit that was screaming inside of me. But he was always there. And when I was ready to get my life changed, they put so much honor towards him and the church that I knew where I had to go to get right. It was honor. And honor has just always been a part of my DNA. And so whenever I see honor taking place, it always causes me to be taken back. When I see somebody helping an elderly lady, it, it causes me to be taken back. When I see somebody stopping and buying somebody food on the corner, it causes me to be taken back. When I see a husband honoring his wife and a wife honoring her husband, it causes me to be taken back. Because like I said, materialism was not modeled before me as success. Honor was. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now at this point in my life, honor is the thing 
that takes me back. And I'll never forget a few years back, I, I was traveling with my spiritual father to uh, Abuja, Nigeria. And, and we went all over, Wari, Lagos, but it was in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, that we had gone to a church and I had never seen honor like I experienced in Africa. And not just Nigeria, whether it was Kenya, whether it was Ghana, whether it was South Africa, wherever I've been in Africa, honor has always been up here. And I'll never forget, Abuja was my first trip to Africa. And we were pulling up to the church, and I took some footage, so I'll kind of take you there with me. We were pulling up to the church, and all of these people were lined up for miles to welcome us. And then they let off fireworks like a Super Bowl show <laughs> as we were pulling up. In, in the service, when we entered the service, they spent months preparing these shows that they wanted to do for us, these, these dances, these songs that they wanted to sing for us. They, they spent months getting them together. And I mean, they were stacking each other up like pyramids, like you see cheerleaders do at a football game. They were bringing out awards. They had the president of Nigeria there to greet. And, and when, I, when I got into the service, I was so taken away because I'm sitting in this service with probably 20,000 people in the building that walk to church because they did not have cars. And I'm watching all these, I'm watching as the pastor preaches, people that are so poor that they cannot afford paper are writing notes on their arms, writing notes on their stomachs so they can read them in the mirror. And the pastor had whispered, he said, they will not take showers all week. Wow. Because they don't want to lose a word that was spoken in service that ministered to them. Mm. And the coolest thing I saw was, even in the most intense worship, I mean, people crying, people screaming, people on the floor, you name it. When the pastor of that church, when he was up, everybody was up. The minute he sat down, you would see 20,000 people like a wave sit down. And when he stood up, all 20,000 stood up. And I was just taken back. And now I do that with my spiritual father. Whenever he stands, I stand. Whenever he sits, I sit. But I, I remember watching that, and we went into the back, and I said, you know, in America, they would say that's too much. That's very cult-like in a way. He said, you Americans are funny. <laughs> That's my Nigerian voice. He said, the, the pastor said, remember, we gave you the Bible. You did not give us the Bible. If it was not for Africa, the Bible would have died. It was the Ethiopian and the Egyptian uh, monks and, and Coptics that kept it going after Jesus. If, if, if it did not, if it was not for Africa, there would be no Bible. It would have died with the apostles. They wrote it and they wrote the transcripts in Ethiopia. And, and the Bible did not go from Europe to the United States. It originated in Africa after it was in Israel. And so he said, remember, we gave you the Bible. You didn't give us the Bible. He said, and the way we live is different than you. Because in America, you all get frustrated when you can't take a vacation. Mm -hmm. It is this mentality that causes the good Lord to give us rain. Mm -hmm. And because honor has always been the thing. That would make me say hashtag winning, hashtag success. It caused me to be just taken back. 
Because I had never seen honor like that. And we're going somewhere today. But in our faith, honor is everything. God said this in 1 Samuel 2, verse 30. He said, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. Those that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Look what God is saying. God is saying that when somebody honors me, they put me in a place where I have to honor them. What is honor? Honor is when you set apart something or esteem it highly. It's separated. That's what honor is. It means that it's in a category all by itself and nobody can touch it or disrespect it. It's honor. It, it really comes down to what Galatians says, reaping and sowing. Uh, be not deceived, God's not mocked, whatever a man sows, he shall reap. It, God is saying that when you give me honor, I promise I will honor you back. Honor is the thing that gets God's attention. Honor is the thing that causes God to be taken back. When's the last time with honor that we know we cause God to be taken back. Like the queen of Sheba, when she came to see Solomon, it says that she traveled from Ethiopia. That's actually where the Ethiopian monks originated from, was Queen Candace, uh, the queen of Sheba, when she came to see Solomon, it says she was taken back, which means she was just like, whew. And I know she was like that because history recalls that she didn't go back without anything. She went back with Solomon's seed inside of her. And she would give birth to a baby named uh, Menelik, who mean, whose name means son of wisdom. And to this day, you will find African Ethiopians with Jewish blood inside of them. Netflix has a documentary or a movie called The Red Sea Resort. It's all about Israel trying to save Ethiopians with Jewish blood in them. And that goes all the way back to the Queen of Sheba when she got pregnant by King Solomon. But when she was taken back, it says she gave Solomon all the riches she brought with him. Because whenever people see that you live a life of honoring God, because Solomon built something that nobody else had built before him. He built God a temple and he built God a nice palace. The palace was for him to live in, but he wanted something so big and grand that when people saw it, they were taken back, not because of what he built, but because of how much he loved the God he built it for. And she was so taken back because of his honor towards God that she honored him because honor will always draw honor. In our text today, we are going to see a man who went above and beyond to honor God. And there's just a couple things that I noticed before I get into the text that stood out to me about this Roman centurion and his honor and things that God wants us to honor. Number one, I've learned in life that you have to have honor for God's presence. We'll get to the word next. Honor for his presence. David said, Lord, th this, this is what I ask you for. Whatever you do, don't take your presence from me. When he sinned with Bathsheba, he said, Lord, whatever you do, just don't take your presence from me. I honor it too much. 
The, the scripture says that when the glory, the Shekinah glory, showed up in Solomon's temple, it, it was so thick and so heavy that the priest could not minister, the singers could not sing. God's presence was so powerful that it shut down their agenda. You haven't honored God's presence until his presence has shut down your agenda. It's just an honor. If I have to choose between being late to my job, and I've done this for years, and I've done this a few times, and, and getting my 10 minutes of prayer in, I'm going to be 10 minutes late to work rather than spend, not spend my 10 minutes in God's presence. Yeah, I, I need to give God that before I leave. I would rather tell them sorry than God sorry. I, I would rather tell them sorry than not have God tell me to keep my kids home from school because the shooter's coming today. I, I would rather tell my boss sorry than, than not hear God tell me to, to stay home or to tell my spouse to stay home or my mother to stay home because they could get in a car accident or I could get in a car accident today. I, I need to hear God's whispers in the morning. People always say, well, what do I do if I don't, I, I don't know how to talk for 10 minutes? Pray the Lord's Prayer and then shut up and listen for the next eight. Just say, Lord, I don't want to talk. You know my needs before I even pray them. I want to thank you for the day, and I want to ask you to open doors today. You're great. You're marvelous. I'm going to tell you how great you are, and then I'm just going to say, Lord, the platform is yours. Tell me what I need to hear today. And I'm going to give him permission to speak, because if I don't give him permission to speak, how can I be mad if something tragic happens? So I have to have an honor for his presence. His presence that follows me to work, that follows me to hospitals, that, that follows me and follows my family wherever they go. I have to have honor for his presence. I have honor for his presence when I'm in my car. That's why I don't play just anything. I have honor for his presence when I'm in my living room. That's why I don't just watch anything. You gotta have a honor for God's presence because if you don't want him with you all the time, he won't bless you any of the time. You have to have an honor for his word. Yeah, I, I skipped too quick earlier. An honor for his word. The Bible says that God's word, when he speaks it, it does not return to him. Void. It accomplishes that which he set out for it to do. God's word is so powerful that if God calls you healed, you're healed. If God calls you blessed, you're blessed. If God calls you married, I don't know where they're coming from, whether it's the UPS delivery guy or the burger guy at Burger King or somebody in church or the lawyer you meet at the court. Wherever it's going to come from, it's going to come from. When God calls you something, it has to line up. Sometimes what I want to know, God, is what are you saying about me? What are you saying about my family? What are you saying about this sickness? I heard what the doctor said, but what are you saying about this? Because at the end of the day, God's word is the only word that can impact your life. God's word is the only word that matters when your world is falling apart. Your boss's words don't matter. Your children's words don't matter. Your spouse's words don't matter. Your family's words don't matter. And guess what? Your hater's words don't matter. The the only word that matters is, God, what are you saying about me? So his word, when he speaks it, is so powerful. It don't return to him. God cares about his word so much that, listen to what he says. It says that he, he, he magnifies or exalts his word above himself. God says, if you want to know what I honor, pick up your Bible. God honors his word above himself. This is why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God 
is honor. In the book of Nehemiah, the people had so much honor for God's word that it says that when Ezra stood behind the pulpit they built so that when he spoke, he could be above the people. That's where the pulpit came into the Bible. It says he, he was trying to be above the people so he could see the faces of the people. And it says that when he opened the book of the law, not grace, the law, the law, death, consequences, hell, the people stood up shouting. The people had such an honor for the word that even though it was a negative word, the preacher didn't have to say, can you all stand? There was so much hunger for the word that the minute the book was cracked open, the people stood up shouting. God looks for honor with, with, with his word. God looks for honor with his structures. To be a Christian means that your life is structured. Everything about our lives is supposed to be structured. Without a structure, you collapse. God has a structure for our lives, a structure for how we handle singleness when we're in that season, a, a, a structure for how the marriage is supposed to be. He said in 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3, he said, the, 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 the head of the man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. There's a structure. And when the structure is not operated or executed the right way, everything falls apart. See, what my mother was teaching me with my father is that though he was an abusive husband, because he abused her, and I would see that with my own eyes, he was a drinking husband, he was a drug addict husband. As long as he was her husband, she honored him. And when the day came, when she had to get out, she no longer had to practice that honor with him. Because people will honor you, but guess what? If you don't get yourself together, that honor can have an expiration date on it. Yeah. But as long as she was in it, she honored him. There's an honor, there's a, there's a structure with Marriage. There's a structure with church. The Bible says, let all things be done in decency and in, in order. There's a structure. I've been to churches where everybody's just running wild. You say, what's going on today? Whatever the spirit wants to happen. <laughs> I came up in those kind of churches, so you didn't have Sunday plans because church was five hours yeah. on a good week, on a good week. I'm going to get you out of here by noon at the latest. The spirit shown up here is 1215 <laughs> with, a, with an altar call. The Bible says, let the spirit be subject to the prophet. I'm the prophet. <laughs> but there's an order. There's an order to things. There's an order to dating. There's an order to marriage. There's, there's an order to church. There's a structure to everything God's in. Because without structure, everything will collapse. And this is where I need some help. This is where I need all my tithers to get behind me. Where are my tithers at? All right. I need that same energy because we're on the roller coaster ride for about three minutes. And we're pulling the little uh, belt over our chest. But God needs honor with his money. <gasps> Why did I say his money? Because we're just stewards of what belongs to him. So God wants honor with his money. Solomon said, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thy increase. What is the first fruits? It's 10%. That's what it is. And this is the part where stingy people get uncomfortable. Did you like your cable and your nails? 
and wonder why everything's falling apart. Honor the Lord with the first fruit. It's 10%. Jesus would say it like this. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and God what belongs to God. You cannot tell the government to stop taking your taxes. That's Caesar's. Try them. I tried once and I lost bad. <laughs> you cannot beat them. God says, if they're taking their 25% out before you touch it, why is it that I get what's left? Why do I get what's left after they take what they take? If I'm God, then where's my honor? He says, honor me. This is honor. It is honor. This is why for me at 19, I started tithing. Because why? I knew honor. And when the preacher read a scripture on honor, I said, I cannot honor all the way and not give God my tithe. It's not what's left after the bills are paid. It's not what's left after taxes. He gets what he gets off the top. I knew I knew I knew what side those. Where y'all at? Y'all supposed to be helping me. God is so well, let me read the, the good part. <laughs> so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. He says, whenever I'm not honored with your money, there will be no overflow. Mm, that's good. There will always be just enough. And here, and this got me years ago. Look at how God gauges money. He says, the love of money is the root of all evil. The clubs are not the root of all evil. Hip-hop artists and R&B singers are not the root of all evil. Bad politicians are not the root of all evil. Fornication is not the root of all evil. Adultery is not the root of all evil. Murder is not the root of all evil. The love of money. So God says, I know how you determine who's good and who's evil. But God says, I determine who's good and who's evil by how they handle their money. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. If you get the root in order, the fruit will be in order. But if the root is evil, everything else is dying. So God says the love of money is the root. So when you're questioning God, what's happening with my fruit? God says, I cannot give you a healthy tree with bad roots. So we honor the Lord. Will a man rob God? You have robbed me in tithes and offerings. One time I had a person that owed me a couple thousand dollars. I lent to him. And, and they, they, they wanted to take me out to dinner. And I thought they were taking me out to pay me back. <laughs> and they, they took me to a, you know, a decent restaurant. Now, you know, I'm ready for my money to be slid across the table. And all they did was pay for the food and get up and not address it. And what they didn't realize is I couldn't appreciate the meal and the gesture because of what they owed me. I would have rather them given me that food money towards what they owed me rather than take me out and not bring it up. When we give God anything, yet we're not tithing. God says, I can't appreciate the gesture because you still owe me the 10%. This is why the scripture says, if you don't give with a cheerful heart, keep it. Because you're not getting anywhere with God with $5 and $10. Put, put that in your savings. You're going to need it. Because he's not bringing overflow. You're going to need that $5 for gas. God looks for the tenth. And anything outside of the tenth, he says, keep it. Because it's 
all about honor. So you honor his money. And I know this is uncomfortable, but it's only uncomfortable to the people that ain't tithing. And so we honor him with his money. I remember I had a preacher come in years ago, and he, his name's Joe Freeman. He used to be the chaplain for, for the Wizards. And he, he goes around the world now teaching black history and has a great exhibit. We brought him out uh, in February before just he sets up his whole black history exhibit. It literally could take up our whole lobby, and he can't even get all of it in there. But he, he has the license to recreate. The, he's the only person in the world that has it, but he can recreate life-size replicas of the Rosetta Stone. And so he travels the world teaching on the Rosetta Stone. And uh, he came out and he created a diagram once. And the diagram, what it did was it talked about the, the system of giving. And it says that there's the giver, then there's God, then there's the church. So when you give your tithe, you're actually, even though you're sowing into the church that's feeding you, because that's where you sow. You don't sow into 10 different places. And, or The Bible says you bring to the storehouse that is feeding you. Galatians 6 talks about that. So you give to God. You're not giving to the church. You give to God. And what does God do? God gives to the church. Yeah. So it's not, well, what's the church doing with my money? It's number one, it's not your money. And you're not giving to the church. You're giving to God. God's giving to the church because if you're giving to the church, then guess what? You're going to need the church if you get cancer. Yeah. You're going to need the church if you lose your job. But if you're giving to God, I would rather need God than people. Yeah. Yeah. So you give to God and God gives the blessing to the church. That's how it goes. And then guess what God does? He starts the process all over and he will always, as the scripture says, give seed to the sower. Mm -hmm. All right. You can take your, your buckle off. <laughs> Hopefully. You have to have honor with his people. The least, the lost, the left out, the elderly. There's all kinds of people in the Bible that God says to honor that we walk past. But to love God means you love people. It means that you are always your brother's keeper. Who is my brother? Anybody in this world who if I cut them, they bleed red. That's my brother. They are made in the image of God. I hear churches talk about stuff and it's so stupid. I'll hear pastors get up and say, well, we're obligated to the body of Christ. No, we are obligated to the world. Yes. For God so loved the, not the church. We are our brother's keeper. keeper, whether it's wells needing to be built in Africa or Mexico or, or programs that need to be started in the city. Somebody's child getting shot could have been your child. That's how you should feel the pain of it. We are our brother's keeper. So we honor God by honoring his people, the least, the lost and the left out. Jesus taught about this in Matthew 25. We, we have to have an honor for God's leaders. There was a time, the Bible says that when Job walked down the street, all the young men would start running. Why did the young men run when Job came walking down the street? It's because Job represented God. And there was a time in this country when a preacher could walk down the street and everybody's attitudes would change. It didn't matter where it was in the United, it could be the worst corner or the worst prison. When the preacher came in, everything changed. Now, people will smoke a blunt and try to give it to you as a preacher. <laughs> That's the reality. Because we have lost honor yeah. for leaders. And so part of honoring God means that you honor the people that God puts in your life to lead you. Because the invisible God gives you visible people. Yeah. 
and says, I know how much you love me by how much you love the vessels I put in your life to help make you better. So if you're taking notes down, we're talking about honor with his leaders. And you'll see this through the scriptures like David, when they said, the guy said, I killed King Saul. David said, were you not scared to touch the Lord's anointed? You, we have no power to determine who's God's people and who's, God, who's not God's people. So you have to be careful when YouTube and things like that are running wild that you don't get caught up in it because just because they're saying something doesn't mean that that's not God's person. And Miriam and Aaron will tell you that God hears everything about his people. So there has to be an, an honor. Romans 13 verse 1 says this. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be ordained by God. Whoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they resist, they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not terrors to good works, but to the evil. Will then thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you shall have praise of the same. We take it a little bit further. We're talking about honor. Paul tells Timothy. He says, Timothy, them elders that rule well, especially the ones who labor in the word and doctrine, they are worthy of double honor. He says, honor all kinds of people, husbands, wives, parents, bosses. But the people that sow into our lives spiritually, he says, they deserve double honor. So it is an honor with leaders. And lastly, it is an honor with God's house. God cares about the house. All through the scriptures, you see blessings tied to houses. When the prodigal son left the house, he got in trouble. There is an honor with the house. David said, man, in Psalms 122, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. The king was still so in love with God and had so much honor with God that every time going to church came up, he got excited. He said, I was glad. I was glad. He would say in one psalm, he said, man, a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. He says, man, I would rather be in a parking lot or in a lobby than to hang out in the wrong environments. And now we see glimpses of why God made him king. He had so much honor and love for God's house. Do you realize what would happen to our country if all the houses of God shut down? I, I was with my spiritual father and he was teaching on Juneteenth. We, we were in Ohio and I was with him for the week and he was teaching a message and he, he, he was talking about Simon who carried the cross with Jesus and how he was from Africa. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that or notice that, but he was from Africa. And Mark, one of the disciples, was from Africa. And a lot of people look at Mark like he was a Hebrew boy, but he was from Africa. And, and Simon, who picked up the cross when Jesus was stumbling, was from Africa. And, and he did a whole teaching on on. Mark knowing them because Mark is the only one of the writers that calls him out really by name and also says the father of Rufus and Alexander. He's talking about him and his sons because he, he's, he's known them from back in the day where they grew up. But he was saying how when Jesus dropped the cross, Simon picked it up. And he was saying his concern for the church today is that we are losing the burden for picking up the cross. 
He says, I hear pastors preaching on marriage, relationships, how to get this and how to get that, how to overcome this and how to overcome that. But he said, I'm hearing less and less messages on the cross. And he said, and when we lose the cross of God, we lose the power of God. As a church, we must make up in our minds that the cross will not be dropped on our watch. Because if the cross drops, if the house is closed, the consciousness of our nation, of the world, will diminish. So we have to have an honor for God's house. The Bible says don't forsake the house as some are in the habit of doing. And it's not just showing up. Everything about the house is to point us towards the work of God, to point us towards serving. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and, and some pastors and teachers. This is referred to as the five-fold ministry. One, two, three, four, five. This is what some people say is the hand of God on the world. But why did he give these people? Why did he give these gifts? For the perfecting of the saints. Look at this. For the work of the ministry. The work. The grind. Ministry is work. People were here at 6 o'clock in the morning set up, setting up a parking lot. The ministry is work. People were meeting all week to teach your kids Sunday school lessons. It is work. Do you know some of the best singers in our church don't sing on Sundays? You know why? It's not that they wouldn't sing if we asked them to. It's just that they won't come to the rehearsals. They want the fun, but they don't want the work of the ministry. So God sends gifts for the work of the house. Be, be ye steadfast, Paul said. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. We love that scripture, but in what? The work of the Lord. It's having an honor for the house. The man that we're going to see in our next few minutes practice all these things. We're talking about how to get the promises of God in your home. Because my prayer is that that is what you want for your life. I want God's promises in my home. The man we're going to talk about had so much honor. But the God that the man came to, named Jesus, was also a person of honor. Everything Jesus did was to honor his father. It was his mission. It was his cause. He, he was living on earth to honor his father. So when the scripture says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who taking on the form of a man, humbled himself and became a servant... To be like Jesus means, to, or to think like Jesus means I think with honor. My life is guided with honor. Everything tied to me screams honor, 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 honor. Jesus was a person of honor. And honor draws Honor. Why is honor so important? I heard it said like this before. God is drawn to a place with praise and worship, but he only hangs out in places of honor. So honor draws honor. And we have Jesus arriving back to his home base in Capernaum. I told you last week with the girl with the issue of blood in Jairus, I've, I've been to Capernaum. It's one of the most preserved cities from ancient times in all of Israel. In Capernaum, there's some archaeological digs everywhere, 
But the two things that most people go to Capernaum to see, which sits on the Galilee, is number one, they go to see Peter's house. Peter's house is still standing. When Peter died, they, they built a memorial, a monument around his house around 60 AD. That is where Peter lived. That is the house that Jesus stepped into to heal Peter's mother-in-law. That was Peter's house. These people that we read about are not made-up figures. They are real people that really gave their lives for this faith, that really followed a crazy man named Jesus in their day. Peter's house is still standing. And the other thing that people go to Capernaum to see is a synagogue that dates way before Jesus was born. Now, the thing about this synagogue is this is actually, well, in its day, this would have been the nicest synagogue outside of the temple in Jerusalem. This would have been the nicest synagogue in all of Israel. And, you know, that's cool. But the reason it's so confusing to people is it's the nicest synagogue, but Capernaum was one of the poorest cities. It would be like driving up in the poorest neighborhood in the city and seeing a fancy building. It would just make you scratch your head like, why would you put $500 million into that? Here. And the way church operates, if you don't know, we don't have no, like, sugar daddy church over us, <laughs> you know. So everything that you see our church do, it does because of you. All of this is because of you. This building, which cost about $20,000 a month, is because of you. The backpacks, the families we help, the turkeys we give out, the toys we give out, the Easter egg events, all the thousands of dollars we give out monthly into communities that don't have resources is because of you. Everything you see our ministry do, even running this stream costs thousands of dollars. People don't realize it. But all of that technology, all of the software, just getting on YouTube to stream costs money. Everything we do here is because of you. You give to the Lord, and the Lord gives to the ministry. I say that to say that poor people can't build something like that. So how did this nice, beautiful synagogue get built in one of the poorest cities? That's what we're going to talk about. Jesus has stepped off of Peter's boat into Capernaum. And as he steps off the boat, there's a centurion there beseeching him. Falling down at his feet, begging, Lord, my servant lie at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Now, Luke's trans translation of this says he's ready to die. Ready to die, like Biggie Smalls, you know. He's just ready to die. That's what it says. But Mark, Matthew's letting us know this guy comes and falls down at Jesus' feet. Now, you must understand, Romans carried themselves in this time with dignity. A centurion? If, if you've ever seen Gladiator with Russell Crowe, yeah. picture Russell Crowe fully dressed standing in front of Jesus. That's what a centurion would have looked like. And you have to imagine the look on Peter, James, John, all their faces, seeing their leader having a face-to-face -face with a Roman centurion. It's power to power. It's Caesar, Caesar's kingdom talking to God's kingdom. It's kingdom to kingdom talking. And the disciples are sitting back like, 
What? You mean to tell me Rome is taking our leader serious? And he's not just talking to Jesus. This powerful man is begging Jesus for something. I've learned in life that eventually even the strongest of us will beg Jesus for something. Yes. Give it some time. But let that, that little girl get some cancer. Let, let your spouse come, come down with something. Let, let, let somebody get in a car accident that you love. Let, let them be ready to take everything you worked your life for. I don't care how big you are, whether it's now or in hospice. You will fall down to Jesus. This big gladiator is falling down before Jesus. And he says, Lord, do you know this is the first person to call him Lord? Thomas won't call him Lord till he touches the wounds. P Peter won't even get a glimpse of him being the Messiah till almost close to the, to, the, to the crucifixion when Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And he says, you are the Messiah. This man is calling Jesus Lord when his boys are still trying to figure out who he is. See, God has a way of putting people in your life when you're getting started that see beyond where you are and see you for where you're going. They see you for what you're capable of. They see you based on how God has brought you into this world. Stop living based upon what people think about you. Stop leading because you think people don't take you serious. You're not leading the way you're supposed to. God says, if you just stay faithful, I'm going to send some people into your life that see you as a big deal, that want to give you an opportunity that, that are going to look beyond your flaws and see your potential. Yeah. This man is seeing Jesus as Lord. Yeah. And he's a Gentile. It's crazy how sometimes strangers will see more in you than even your family. He says, my servant, is lying tormented with palsy. Now, what I forgot to say when I got started is, the thing about honor is honor is not a heart thing. Honor is a head thing. If you honor people with your heart, then what will happen is you'll stop honoring them if they break your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Honor is a decision. I learned a long time ago, there are certain conversations you can't bring your heart into. They require your head. Family requires your heart. But honor is a decision. I will always honor you. I will always honor by doing this. It's a, it's a decision, good times or bad. Because if I do it with my heart, then my honor will be fickle. And every time my heart is broken, I will run. And my honor runs with me. Yeah. Hold that there. <laughs> the servant is sick with palsy. Now, Jesus is, in a lot of ways, a head. He's the head of his organization. The Roman centurion is a head. He's a head over a legion of soldiers. We have two heads talking. This is a power conversation. We have two heads talking. Put that there. About a person who has palsy. What is palsy? It's when the body turns on the head. It's when the body no longer receives messages that the head is sending. It's when the body gets into rebellion with the head. It's when your mind tells your finger to move and your finger stays still. So we have a head talking to a head about a head that's not working effectively. A head that is able to operate its body. 
And in a lot of ways, the man with palsy represents God's people. The head being Christ is sending signals to the people. But because the people don't have honor, they're not responding. And Jesus is allowing his boys to peek in on this situation, this conversation. He says, my servant. Whoever this servant was, it does not tell us his or her name. But it does let me know that they are a person worth fighting for. They are a person that if they die, his life gets worse. And you always want to live the kind of life that your absence makes somebody else's life horrible. So Jesus says to the man, I'll come. I'll come. I'll come and heal him. That's what Jesus says. Now, to go into a Jewish man's house went against, I mean, a, a Gentile man's house went against the law. His house was not kosher. His house was not swept. To go with him into his house would mean that Jesus is breaking the law. He's breaking his rules to go with this man. Now, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but, but here's the thing about pleasing God and living a life of honor. Whenever God finds a person that lives a life of honor, like the centurion, we're going to see, whenever God finds somebody that lives a life of honor, God will break a rule to bless you. God will break a rule to turn your situation around. God will make a rule to help, break a rule to help you have victory. God will break a rule to help you get a miracle. God will break a rule to help you get what you need. See, God is always looking for somebody he can break a rule for. A rule like you shouldn't have it at this age in your life. A rule that says you're too sick to get healed. A rule that says you're too damaged to ever find a good person. God says, if I can get you serious and I can get you to live a life of honor, I will break a rule to bless your life. I don't care if people talk about me. I don't care if they blog or post about me. God says, if I find somebody that lives a life of honor, I will break a Rule. I have a feeling today that before somebody leaves, God is going to break a rule for you. A rule that changes your family, a rule that changes your money, a rule that changes your sickness, a rule that changes your loneliness. How many can feel that when it comes to your life, God is getting ready to break a rule for you? Say, break a rule, Jesus. Say, break a rule, Jesus. Jesus is walking with him. But I had to ask a question, God. Why are you going to his house? Jesus didn't make a habit of just going to people's houses. Why are you, Jesus, doing a house visit? But then I went to Luke and I saw something. Luke adds a little bit more detail into this. It actually says that while the man was talking to Jesus, there were a whole lot of people begging Jesus to help him too. Why are all these elders begging Jesus to help him along with the Roman centurion? They said, this man's worthy for you to do this, Jesus. For he loves our nation. And he has built us a synagogue. Oh, this is why we have this big synagogue in a poor city. There was a man in the city that though it was poor, he didn't have a poor mentality. Yeah. 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 There was a man in the city that says, yes, they could settle for much less, but, but their God deserves much more. 
So, so I'm going to use my money to build God a house like Solomon. I'm going to use my money, not Caesar's money. I'm going to use my money to build God something he's proud of, to build God something I'm proud of, to build God something that can fit people that want to come no matter how many try to come. He says, I'm going to build God a house. And now I understand why Jesus went to his house. Because be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. Because you built my house. Guess what? I'm going to your house with you. Because you honored me. Now I have to honor you. If Jesus would have told him no, Jesus would have been breaking his own rules, his own law, his own promises. But because this man built God a house he was proud of, God says, in your time of need, I am going to walk with you till we get there. This is why God is saying, I need somebody dedicated to the house. Because if you make God's house happen, God says, I'll make every promise come to your house. He built God a house. And now Jesus has to walk to his house. And I'm glad he, he didn't wait till later on to do it. He built God a house in the good times. Most people try to make God deals in bad times. And God says, I cannot change the situation. Now, every now and then you may get a miracle. But God can't break the rule for you. Because if he doesn't allow you to reap what you sow, that goes against his word too. And I need to know that when I pray, he hears me. I need to know that when I pray, I'm not playing catch up. But he's going to make it happen for me. I need to know, God, that when my house needs you, you'll be there. And the only way I can positively know that is when I give my life to building you a house. Jesus says, I will come. I'm not wasting my time. Because here's what you got to get with God. God don't waste his time. Amen. If he comes to your house, healing has come with him. If he comes to your house, what you need has come with him. If he comes to your house, love has come with him. If he comes to your house, restoration has come with him. If he comes to your house, money has come with him. Whatever you need for your house, he is coming with. He says, I will come, but I will also heal. And the centurion says, no, you won't. You're not coming to my house. Not because I'm too good for you, but you're too good for me. I, I'm not worthy. Lord, Lord, here's that Lord again. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Speak a word only. And my servant, not maybe, shall be. He says, Jesus, all I need is a word. I love people that come to church every week saying, Lord, all I need is a word. I, I don't like when people come to check off that box. Or, or, or to use church like, like a spiritual drug to get high with. I love when people are coming to church just to get a word. When's the last time you came to church just to get a word? There are times I can tell people don't come for words. I, I've had times where I'm preaching and I'll see while I'm talking people flipping all over their Bible because they're not looking for something that I'm saying. They're trying to prove to themselves that what I'm saying is wrong. 
And then I catch them handing the Bible over to whoever they came with. See, I told you. <laughs> and rather than listening for a word, you come in to find something wrong. And whenever you stop coming for a word, you stop receiving God's power. He said, I just want a word and my servant will be healed. And this has got to be tripping Jesus up because check this out. The, the next story, read it when you go. The, the next story, same chapter. The next story starts with Jesus enters Peter's home and prays for his mother-in-law. Isn't it crazy that in the next story, Peter is going to say, Jesus, can you come home with me and pray for my mother-in-law? <laughs> and this guy has so much faith that he says, Jesus, I don't want you to come to my home. I just need you to speak a word. You know, the word that doesn't return to God void. The word that God esteems higher than himself. The, the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. The word has so much power. If you only got a hold of how powerful the word is, you would read your devotionals. You would read your Bible. You would try to find out more about God and fall more in love with God. When you realize the power of getting word in you and how your whole life can transform, not by over over time and not by friendships and not by relationships. Your life changes by word. I'm at the place in life where I don't even want people in my life that don't have the word. I get it. You like football. You like baseball. You like basketball. I like those things too. But at the end of the day, I need people in my life that speak word. Iron sharpening iron. It is the word that changes. It is the word that delivers. It is the word that cures. It is the word that brings forth life after death. If you don't get nothing in your life, you will be okay if you just load up with the word. Amen. Speak a word, he says. How do you have this mentality? Oh, he's going to tell us. He's going to give us his definition of honor. For I'm a man. I said, don't get that twisted. I am a man. But I am a man that's under a man. I am a man that is under authority. One of my mentors always tells pastors, he says, don't tell me who you're over till you tell me who you're under. Mm, that's good. I am a man under authority. The scripture says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. I made my mind up a long time ago with my life. I can hear from God, but until God confirms it through my spiritual father, I never move on what's not confirmed. There have been situations I wanted to leave. He said, stay. And I stayed angry and bitter and mad and Frustrated, but praying. And then I watched God how in just six or eight months time change his mind to say leave. Any major decision I've ever made in my life, I've only made it because I got a thumbs up. I have never made a major decision on my own. Now I'm not calling or texting about what color should I paint our lobby and, and should my house have brick walls or vinyl siding? I'm talking about major decisions that could affect people's lives, that could affect my life. I've never made a decision. There have been times when I was a youth pastor, I was dating somebody that I kind of liked. And when the pastor said that's not God's will, I cut it off that day and never texted him back. It's why I've gotten to my promise. Because at the end of the day for me, and I can't speak for everybody, 
But the only thing that matters to me is doing the thing God brought me into this world to do. The, the thing that made my mom say no when my grandparents said get an abortion. And my mom said, no, I will not do that. And she went out on the streets, a county girl, and moved into South Baltimore in the hood because she had nowhere to go because her stomach was filled with me. What was the thing that made my mom say, uh-uh, I got to get him into the world. I got to go through with this. I may lose my family. I may have to go from Anne Arundel County down to Baltimore City and have to figure out a whole new way of life because I got pregnant with a city guy. But there's something that I got to figure out. Why did God get me into this world? That's what I got to figure out before they throw the dirt on my casket. My happiness can wait. I'll be happy, believe me. But the thing that consumes me is why did I go through all of that? Why, 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 why did the wrong people mishandle me as a child? Why did people that my mother trusted that she could leave me with hurt me like that? Why did I watch my best friend get shot in the head as a kid? Why wasn't it me that got shot in the head as a kid? Why, when I should have went to jail for selling drugs, God broke down the chemist's car on the way to the court to get me out of the charge. Where others have gone to jail for 20 years plus that had far less drugs. Why, 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 why did that breakup not push me to suicide? Why, 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 why? And most people would rather be happy than figure out their why. They would rather have a warm body than figure, laying next to them than to figure out there. Wow. They would rather have money in their savings than figure out there. Wow. How bad do you want to figure out? Yes. Oh why, why wasn't my dad around as a kid? Yeah. Why, 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 why? Why, God? Finding my why means more to me than being happy. But here's the thing. If I don't have somebody over me looking at my life from an airplane view, I'm going to make bad decisions. And like the Hebrew people, I'm going to make a seven-day walk into a 40-year journey. So I am a man. And most people would say this makes you less of a man submitting to somebody. He says, I am a man under authority. But guess what? Because I'm somebody's floor, I'm somebody else's ceiling. <laughs> I have to get under who I'm supposed to get under so I can get over who I'm supposed to be over. I'm a man under authority, but guess what? I have servants or people under me. And he says, and, and you know, Lord, you got to understand this. I tell somebody go and they go. I tell another come and, and he, he cometh. I tell my servant do this and, and he doeth it. And it says, and when Jesus heard it, he marveled because this man being a secular boss in a lot of ways, Jesus is marveling because his people get the system better than Jesus' people. His servant. His people come when he calls. His people go when he goes. says go. He says the reason I want this servant to be made better is whatever I tell him to do, he does it. And what are we considered to be of Christ? Servants. God says, when I find somebody that jumps when I say jump, that comes when I say come, that goes when I say go, that is a person like Hezekiah, that the world would be a worse place without him. Jesus is marveling because he gets honor. And the 12 standing around watching are going to scratch their heads for the next three and a half years. And it is going to cost Jesus his life to get them to practice honor. 
Jesus marvels. Jesus is taken back and starts bragging on this dude and says, I have not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. He lived a life of honor. He had people around him that honored him. And now Jesus is taken back because he gets it. When it comes to mine in your life, does our honor cause God to step back? Because until honor makes him step back, you're never going to see a God that could go home with you. Go home with you. And you're going to keep playing church and getting more bitter and bitter and bitter and not better and better and better. Because God is saying, it takes honor to get me to change your home. Because until honor goes into your home, the opposite of honor is confusion. And all it takes is one person in the home to practice honoring God. And once God goes into the home, the whole home has to change. Amen. Jesus says, met, met many people are going to come from the east and to the west. And sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. It's going to be a table talk one day. I always imagine myself walking into heaven and seeing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, seeing Paul, Peter, and James and them. And they're all talking about what they did for the kingdom. And I always wonder if, 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 if I sat down at the table, would I add to the conversation or take away from it? Would my life be the kind of life that I could talk about for eternity or would I run out of things to say in 10 minutes? Many are going to come. But the children of the kingdom, that's us, shall be cast into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, when you see this scripture, it's not referring to hell because you're children of the kingdom. You can't go to hell. What is this referring to? Well, in Revelations, there's this thing called the thousand-year millennial reign. It's when Christ comes back for a thousand years. He's having this huge party for the people that gave their lives for him. And so for a thousand years, he's hanging with the people that were all in. And the other people, it's not that they're in hell. Because yeah, hell people are in hell. You know. They're not in hell. But for a thousand years, they have to stand behind the glass and watch the faithful celebrate with Jesus. That's what they don't teach. The preachers usually just teach heaven and hell. But that thousand year millennial reign is when those that were all in are hanging with Jesus for a thousand years. And those that just played church have to sit and watch. And Jesus says, after this text concerning this man, the reason he's saying it here is, the people who don't get invited, there's one password that gets you into the millennial reign. It's honor. It's honor. That's what he's saying. I don't want to hang out for a thousand years with people who do not practice honor. This Roman centurion is showing us how to hang with Jesus. But he's also exposing to us who will not hang with Jesus. And Jesus goes back to him and says, go your way. As you have believed, so will it be done. He says, 
I'm going to do this because of your belief system. But this text lets me know that if I do not have a life of honor, I will have more than likely a weak belief system. And my belief system will come from my heart and not my head. He says, and his servant was healed. Next year, a a after some therapy, after a little time apart, his servant was healed within the hour. Within the hour of what? Within the hour of him displaying honor. I wonder for somebody, what could happen in the next hour if God got honor out of you? What, what would happen in the next hour if you said, Lord, from this day forward, I'm going to honor your word. From, from this day forward, I'm going to honor your presence. From, from this day forward, I'm going to honor your, your structure. From this day forward, I'm going to honor your people. From this day forward, Lord, I'm going to honor your money. From this day forward, Lord, I'm going to have honor with your leaders. And from this day forward, I'm going to have honor with your house. Now, understand, you cannot pick which one you want to do. The Roman centurion practiced all of these. Speak a word. He honored the word. He, he honored the present. I'm not worthy for you to waste your time with me. He honored the presence. He, he honored the structure. I have somebody over me. I have somebody under me. I speak, they move. I tell them, come, they come. He honored structure. He honored people. It says he loved the nation of Israel and built them a synagogue. He was not Israeli, but he loved Israeli people. You'd be surprised. Sometimes the people that love you the most are not even skinned to you. He was not Hebrew. He was Roman. But he loved the Hebrew people so much. He built them a synagogue. He, he, he loved the people. He honored God with the money because he used his money to build God a first-class synagogue in a poor city. He honored with the money. He honored the leader. We see that with Jesus. He, he had so much honor for Jesus. And he honored the house because he built the house. Once you make up in your mind, not your heart, your mind to be a person of honor, honor becomes what you do. And when God finds a person of honor, he says, this is your hour. This is your season. This is when your whole house is about to change. What do you have in your life that has palsy? The area of your life that is not attached to the head being Christ. What, what is the area that the head does not have control of? Is it your time? Is it your money? Is it your treasures? Is it your talent? Because any area that the head does not have control of is going to stay tormented. So today I want to pray for that area, that as we give it to God, things would start to shift. When I was praying and asking God for a word, I knew this was the word because I've never in all the years I've pastored this church, I've never had to say more than two Sundays for people to sponsor backpacks and not have all the events paid for this year 
I can count on two hands how many people have even sponsored one kid. And when we stop responding to what God is calling us to do as a church, then God stops giving us his oil to make it happen. And what it comes down to is a lack of honor for the house. A majority of people in here are not tithing. That's our commitment. That's how we honor God. And without that, we're living in defeat. Because Jesus said, I gauge good and evil by money. And I know it's tough. And I know it's tough to hear. But do you know that the biggest thing that Jesus taught the most, read the Bible, all through his ministry, 70% of his teachings were on money and possessions. I wish Jesus was my pastor. Well, that means seven out of 10 Sundays, Jesus is preaching to you about giving. Until we live lives of honor and put God where God belongs, we're never going to see our homes changed. And if our homes are not changed, our communities are not changed. So today, I want to pray for people that are ready to say, God, when you look at my life, I do not want there to be palsy in any area connected to me. I want honor to flow into my marriage. I want honor to flow with my children. I want honor to flow with my, with my time. I want honor to flow with my money. Lord, I want every area connected to me to show you honor. Yeah. And if you can make God step back, I'm crazy enough to believe that within the next hour, God can start making something happen.